Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Sri Subhuvaja Iti Prasadya Giriso. Sukhe Tur Arindamam. Jatamam Swavimanena Vasyatos Mayatos Tainama Translation Sukadeva Goswami continued. Bring it down a little, I can't see the whole thing. There you go, right there, that's good. O King Pariksit, Sudura of the enemy. After Chitraketu satisfied Lord Shiva and his wife Parvati, he boarded his airplane and left as they looked on. When Lord Shiva and Parvati saw Chitraketu, although informed of the course, was unafraid, they smiled, being fully astonished by his behavior. At this too, Bhagavan Rudra, Rudra Nim Ida Ambravit, Nevarsi Daitya. Siddhanam prasadanam shisrinvatam. Thereafter, in the presence of the great sage Narada, the demons, the inhabitants of Siddhaloka, and his personal associates, Lord Shiva, who is most powerful, spoke to his wife Parvati while they all listened. Sri Rudra Uvasya. Drisvatvatriyasi sushroni parer abhuta karmanaha mahatmyam vritta vrityanam nisprahanam mahatmanam. Translation. Lord Siva said, My beautiful, my dear beautiful Parvati, have you seen the greatness of the Vaishnavas? being service of the servants of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Hari, they are great souls and not interested in any kind of material happiness. Report. Lord Shiva, the husband of Parvati, told, told his wife, my dear Parvati, you are very beautiful and your bodily features. Certainly you are glorious, but I do not think you can compete with the beauty and glory of the devotees who have become servants of the servants of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Of course, Lord Shiva smiled when he joked in this way with his wife, for others cannot speak like that. The Lord, the Supreme Lord, Shiva continued, is always exalted in his activity, and here is another example of his wonderful influence upon Chitraketu. His devotee, just see, although you cursed the king, he was not at all afraid or sorry. Rather, he also respected you, called you mother, and accepted your curse, thinking himself faulty. He did not say anything in, retaliate, in retaliation. This is the excellence of my devotee. By mildly tolerating your curse, he has certainly ex excelled the glory of your beauty and your power to curse him. I can impartially judge that this devotee, Chichakutu, has defeated you and your excellence simply by becoming a pure devotee of the Lord. As stated by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Tayor Api Suheshnuna, just like a tree, a devotee can tolerate all kinds of curses and reverses in life. This is the excellence of a devotee. And directly, Lord Shiva forbade Parvati to commit the mistake of cursing a devotee like Chitraketu. He indicated that though she was powerful, the king, without showing any powerful power, had excelled her power by his tolerance. Om again to Melandasya, Genajana Salakaya, Chakshun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurveena Maha. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Nandi Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharini Nirvisesa Suryavari
Paschatya ne sitari ne manchikopa turubischa. Pripa sindu be vacha patitanam bhavane vyo. Vaishnavi vyo namaho namaha jai si Krishna chaitanya. Prabhu Nityananda si advaita gadad har si vasani gora vakta vinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. <coughs> Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. Well, it's an interesting little interaction here between Lord Shiva, Parvati, and Chitraketu. And how, although Chitraketu didn't really commit any offense, but he was seen in that way. And he was cursed. He didn't try to defend himself. He could have, in saying that you really don't you didn't understand me. He didn't try to defend himself at all. He accepted that these great personalities, Lord Shiva and Parvati, are very powerful, and therefore, what they are, what Parvati is saying about me, obviously. Is true, although it wasn't. She had assumed that he was offensive, but he wasn't offensive, although it appeared in that way. He acted a little bit outside of the normal etiquette, but it wasn't offensive. And but she saw it as being offensive, and she cursed him. He accepted the curse on his head as being the mercy of the Lord coming. And uh, he simply offered respects and prayers to Parvati. Shiva was watching in astonishment that she just didn't know such amazing qualities. Although Parvati is the uh, personification of the material energy, she's very powerful. Shristi Sisti Spalaya Sadhyeka Jayeva Niva Vibhati Durga Vichana Rupa Yasya Apase Sate Sa Yad Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bajami. She is called Chaya or Shadow and she's she can she can annihilate, she can create. She has very many great powers. And uh, but and she's also, as Bhav Shiva indicates here, she's also very beautiful. But Shiva is saying, look at the Vaishnavas. What is their beauty? Compared to yours, their beauty is far greater. greater. In fact, you are nothing compared to them. <laughs> they accept whatever is given to them by the mercy, as the mercy of the Lord, and do not complain or do not try to retaliate. Just see. And this verse by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the most important verse in the Shastras, at least for the Vaishnavas when it comes to understanding how one should behave. Tayora Ahiv Api Shuhishnuna refers to tolerance. Um, tolerance is a very important quality and a very uh, rare quality in the age of Kali, especially. Sometimes we find ourselves having to tolerate in order to fulfill our desires. But in this case, he wasn't trying to fulfill his personal desires in order and that's why he tolerated. He simply tolerated it because he's a Vaishnava and he tolerates reverses in the spirit of acceptance. And uh, he, uh, he offered beautiful prayers. And Shiva, and you'll see, and I think it, it's coming up. I think it might even be the next verse. It's one of the most important verses in this whole it's one of the important verses in the entire Bhagavatam where Shiva glorifies the Vaishnavas. But here, uh, he's glorifying uh, Chitraketu for his uh, outstanding qualities. 
So a Vaishnava is known by their qualities. A Vaishnava is known by their activities and by their qualities, but mostly by their qualities. Because even though a Vaishnava may excel in many activities, if they don't have any good qualities or the qualities are not up to the standard, they, uh, they, they may be seen as something less. And they are it's actually seen in that way. But here in this particular case, uh, he tolerated and was happy about it. He had a smile on his face, thinking that this is the mercy of the Lord. And it will actually prove to be in the long run, and that that you're getting into the essence of this particular pastime of the appearance of Chichukitu as he takes on the effects of a curse by taking the body of a demon. For the devotee to take on the body of a demon is like the worst thing. But in this case, it wasn't because it led to his uh, ultimately liberation from the material energy and uh, ultimately his uh, achievement of the spiritual world. So uh, in the scriptures, it says that there are 26 prominent qualities of a Vaishnava. Uh, it's mentioned in many places in the scriptures. And those 26 qualities are how a devotee lives. So these qualities are conducive to bhakti. They're used generally in the mode of goodness, not in the modes of passion and ignorance. Not that the qualities that they're, they are uh, uh, able to make much money, <laughs> that's not one of their qualities. <laughs> is that they are humble, tolerant, free from false prestige and pride, and uh, see everyone as worthy of respects. That is, uh, that is a Vaishnava. And that verse given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Trinata Pi, Sunichena Tayorya Api, Sahishnuna, Amaninam um, Amanadena Kirtaniya Sadarahi. The verse ends by saying Kirtaniya Sadarahi, which means that by practicing these qualities, one can come to the platform of chanting Hare Krishna continuously without stopping. So without these qualities, it's not possible to make to come to that platform. And so these qualities are indigenous to the soul's existence. But because we live in this material existence, these qualities are covered by our the external environment, particularly in our activities in this material world. So one has to practice developing these qualities. Qualities uh, do in some in, in a certain way manifest themselves according to the advancement the devotee is making in the practice of Krishna consciousness. But it's it's more more clearly understood that these qualities come by way of cultivating the qualities. In other words, when you're put in a situation where you have to be tolerant and you actually achieve that, and then the quality starts to manifest in one's character, they become part of one's uh, character. If we think, oh, oh I'll just practice these qualities uh, separate from any situation. No, is that when we are in the situation, that's where the qualities develop. When we are put in the situation that we have to act tolerantly, otherwise you know, we, uh, we will cause like some dissension in the in the situation or humility, which is also mentioned in that same verse that to be humble. In fact, humility is considered to be 
the foremost of all of the qualities that a Vaishnava has because it allows one to become engaged in devotional service nicely. Humility is a quality that uh, places one in, in a position to receive the full mercy of the Lord. So here the comparison is, is being made by Lord Shiva that all of the good qualities that Parvati has are insignificant compared to these qualities that the Vaishnavas have. And this is the glory of the Vaishnavas. They are known for their qualities. Sometimes they are known for their achievements, but more important and more related to the devotee's character is their personal qualities. Oh, he's humble. He's very, he has very talent. He's non-envious. These are all qualities that must be practiced regularly. And by practicing along with executing our service in, de in devotion, we have these qualities start to manifest in the heart and mind of the devotee. And then it becomes natural to exhibit these qualities because they become the character of the devotee. And that's something that is external that has to be brought in under circumstances. So, yeah, so one should uh, carefully understand this principle here that the, the devotees are glorious because they have all good qualities. And uh, let's go to one verse in the uh, fifth canto, 18th chapter, verse number 12. Five eighteen twelve. Yes, yes, the Bhakti of Bhagavati Akinchana, Savai Gunas Tatra Samastate Sudaha, Arava Bhaktas Kato Mahagunan Mano Rate Nasati, Dayato Bahi. All the demigods and their exalted qualities such as religion, knowledge, and renunciation become manifest. The body of one who has developed unalloyed devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vasudeva, on the other hand, a person devoid of devotional service engaged in material activity has no good qualities. Even if he is adept in the practice of mystic yoga or the honest endeavor for maintaining his family and relatives, he must be driven by his own mental speculation and must engage in the service of the Lord's external energy. How can there be any good qualities in such a man? So here we're hearing both. What is good qualities and how they manifest and what appears to be good qualities, but because it is under the influence of the external energy, that means it's not permanent and it's not a good quality. And it's important. Go down the page. You'll keep going here. It says here that there is 26 good qualities. A devotee is kind to everyone, does not make anyone his enemy, truthful, equal to everyone. No one can find fault in him, magnanimous, mild, always clean, without possessions, works for everyone's benefit, very peaceful. Always surrender to Krishna, no material desires, very meek, steady, controls his senses, does not eat more than required, not influenced by Maya, offers respects to everyone, does not desire any respect for himself, is very grave, merciful, friendly, poetic, expert, and silent. So these are mentioned in different places as the foundation for all of the good qualities that a devotee should cultivate because Krishna consciousness means cultivating good qualities. Sometimes people ask, how can you tell a person is making advancement? Usually they ask the question about themselves. How do I know I'm making advancement? Well, here is an indication that these qualities are starting to manifest in one's character. This is a one of the prime reasons why uh, how one can understand whether one is making advancement. 
because um, these qualities will manifest by the power of one's devotional service. And so one should take a note of these qualities and try to practice them in a very regular way. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, I'm still here. So, uh, one, I was just thinking about what to say. Um, so, therefore, yeah, devotional service is not simply performing an activity, but performing an activity in relationship to the quality of character of a real devotee. So a devotee is known by his character. And he, these, these 26 are the foundation for all, of all the good qualities there. And of course, that verse from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, His Holiness uh, Sach Rup Maharaj many years ago uh, wrote one book and it's divided into two parts. And one part is the 26 qualities of devotees as we read here. And he explains each one of them in detail. So uh, one should understand what it means to be truthful, what it means to be kind, what it means to be magnanimous, mild, and clean, what it means to be without no, 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 uh, without no possessions. All these things are part of our spiritual cultivation. So Krishna Kanta mean, consciousness means to work in such a way that one practices the activities of devotional service, offers the activities in devotion to Krishna, and at the same time cultivates the qualities that are conducive to a Vaishnava, such as mentioned here. Uh, turn to the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13, verse number 8. Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13, 8. Uh, chapter 13, verses 8 through 12. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go down. Yeah, open. So here, these are the, these are the, uh, 20 qualities of knowledge. Uh, go down to the translations. It says uh, humility, pridelessness, nonviolence, tolerance, simplicity, approaching a bona fide spiritual master, cleanliness, steadiness, self control, renunciation of the objects of sense gratification, absence of false ego. Possession, the perception of the evil of birth, death, disease, and old age, detachment, freedom from entanglement with children, wife, home, and the rest, even mindedness amid pleasant and unpleasant events, constant and unalloyed devotion to me, aspiring to live in a solitary place, detachment from the gentle mass of people, accepting the importance of self realization and the philosophical search for the absolute truth. All these I declare to be knowledge, and besides this, whatever there may be, is in ignorance. And Prabhupada makes one point here as he reads, he says, the accepting the importance of self-realization. And so this, he said, this is the main quality out of all of these things, you know, that one should aspire for self-realization or Krishna consciousness. The very long purport, and it gives and an, a detailed explanation of many of the qualities mentioned here. So you'll find throughout the scriptures, and there are other verses also that list in a very extensive way the qualities of the devotee. If you go to chapter 16 of Bhagavad Gita, the first verse. Verse number one, which is verse one through three. Yeah. Yeah, it's another series of 
the Supreme Personality, Godhead says, fearlessness, purifications of one's existence, cultivation of spiritual knowledge, charity, self-control, performance of sacrifice, study of the Vedas, austerity, simplicity, nonviolence, truthfulness, freedom from anger, renunciation, tranquility, aversion to fault finding, compassion for all living entities, freedom from covetedness, gentleness, modesty, steady determination, vigor, forgiveness, fortitude, cleanliness, and freedom from envy and from the passion of honor. These transcendental qualities O son of Barton, belong to godly men endowed, endowed with divine nature. So some of the li these lists overlap and some of them don't. Then you'll see that in each list there's more and more added. So a devotee has all good qualities. And as we, we can do a check, am I actually, by reading these qualities and comparing it to ourselves and seeing if we're actually developing these qualities, or do we need what do we need? Which ones do we need to work on? And that's important, and that will help us tremendously in our execution of devotional service, because Krishna will not uh, accept our our activities if they're in if they're characteristic of the modes of passion and ignorance. So all of these qualities listed are in the mode of goodness, which is still in the material uh, tabernacle, but still, because they are uh, foundations for spiritual advancement, they are also considered to be important, these qualities. Okay. So a devotee should do that, and that's a regular thing. Am I actually becoming humble? Am I becoming tolerant? Am I actually kind to everyone, or am I kind just to a few people? Uh, so we ask these questions. Am I clean, cleanliness? What does it mean to be clean? clean? And then there are so many principles of cleanliness that needs to be Am I free from fault by finding? Am I determined? So all of these qualities, with devotees should make regular inventories, and this will help us to critique our progress in devotion and service and see where we need. But these are foundational in our advancement in devotional service. That's why Krishna and the Acharyas give so much emphasis on qualities. <laughs> okay. So thank you so very much, Maharaj, for such a beautiful class and enunciating the importance of Vaishnava qualities in connection to our devotional service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do you have time for questions this morning? Uh, yeah, we do. Okay, wonderful. Sukhakar Krishna Das, I see your hand is up. Go ahead, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Chandramani Maharaj, please accept my natural veins at your lotus feet. All rose, all rose, all rose to Chandramani Maharaj. Maharaj, just want to know, his 26 qualities, the fifth quality is no one can find any fault in him. Out of the 26 qualities you read now, yeah. the fifth quality is no one can find fault in him. And the 18th quality is not influenced by Lord's illusory energy. Now, yeah. how we will know that no one can find fault? There may be many ideas, some people may not like. So how do we develop that quality that no one should find any fault in him? Well, there is a, a certain quality that kind of addresses the devotee's way of relating to everyone. And when Prabhupada is asked, how can you tell a Vaishnava? Prabhupada said he's a perfect gentleman or gentle lady. In other words, they give respects to all living entities. So one who is respectful to everyone and works for the benefit of others then automatically they have all good qualities. 
he, there's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, if you can, Tiffany, if you can change, change, turn to that. It's the fifth chapter, verse number seven. Five, seven, Bhagavad Gita. Yoga Yukta Visuratma, Vijitatma Ditendriya, Sarva Bhutatma Bhutatma, Parvana Pina Limpyate. One who works in devotion, who is a pure soul, controls his mind and senses, is dear to everyone, and everyone is dear to him. Though he's working, such a man is never entangled. So, He's dear to everyone and everyone is dear to him. He works in devotion. He acts purely and his mind and senses are fully controlled and engaged in devotional service. Such a person, dira dira jana priya priya karom. That these qualities are mentioned and the prayers to the six Goswami, they were dear to both the, the gentle and to the ruffians. That means to the devotees and the non-devotees. Because they always worked for the benefit of everyone. So that quality is, is uh, outstanding. The one who is a gentleman gives respects to others and always and always works for the benefit of everyone. Therefore, no one can find fault in them. Thank you, Maharaj. The last one I have to is not influenced by Lord's illusion energy. The Maya will always uh, uh, have some space. That means he has to, Kirtan has 24 hours, he has to chant. Because Krishna Bhuliya Jeev Bhagwan Chakare Pachate Mahatake Jopati Adhare. So he should not leave with a gap for Maya to come so that he is away from the Maya. Is it the way? I don't, I don't know how this I understood. How do I see that Maya will not come behind me. Well, Maya is always there. You, you actually call it the verse. The verse is keeping Krishna foremost. <laughs> Prabhupada explains that verse by saying that if you look forward, you see Krishna. If you look right, left, up, down, back, you know, Maya is in all of those, those other places. <laughs> you can keep, your, keep Krishna in front and Maya cannot... Come in front. <laughs> she has to stay behind Krishna. So your point was right. Yeah, you have to be somewhat engaged always in Krishna consciousness or remembering Krishna all the time. Or the tongue, let the tongue vibrate always. Always, whether I'm eating, sleeping, drinking water. Oh, because you are the water, in the taste of water. I should try to reflect everywhere. See the sun. Oh, you are the eyes of Krishna. See the moon. Your eye of Krishna. I see any Mataji. Oh, Paramatma is there. Thank you. Like that, I should be able to bring Krishna everywhere somehow so that Maya cannot come. Is yeah. it there? I just want one who sees me and every me, me and everything and everything in me. I am never lost and he is never lost to me. Bhagavad Gita 630. Yeah, that's what it takes to not be influenced by Maya. <laughs> But probably one more Maharaj, uh, this humility, it is, it is defined as for a Uttama Dikari, the humility you will see at the level of never separation from Krishna. And humility for a Madhya Madhikari, he will not get influenced by the sensual activity with the opposite sect. And the humility, the Kanishya Dikari, he will follow the rules of scriptures. So uh, that we have to try to see that uh, we are not separated from Krishna like that higher level, highest level humility because the definition is it varies no, at various levels. Prabhupada gives a very clear definition of humility. He says one who is not one who is does not want to be honored by others. Uh, So people will honor you, <coughs> but you should not. So, Amanina Amanina yeah. You should give respect and never expect respect. Yeah, because uh, one who wants respect 
then that's a sense of false pride, thinking I'm the body. What is that? Respecting. If a person is respected because they are engaged in devotional service, that is not the same. But still, even that should not be there because the, the mercy that we need in order to perform devotional service is coming by way of the Lord or the Lord's pure devotee. So we don't take credit for any respect given to us because of our position or because of our activities because we know everything is the mercy of the Lord coming through us. So even in the spiritual uh, a tabernacle, the spiritual environment, even though a devotee may be nicely engaged and may be doing nice activities, still they don't, they don't want to take credit for that because they know it's all the mercy coming from the Lord. Maharaj, in one of the lectures, you were with Srila Prabhupada, I heard Amarinda Prabhu was telling that one devotee asked, which is the most dangerous quality, eating, mating, sleeping, defending. So everybody thought it was mating, but Prabhupada said it is sleeping. Can you just put some point on that? I could not understand that. Well, he said oversleeping. In other words, we have to sleep in order to maintain the run. We have to eat also. And there is sometimes a little bit need for defense. Mating is done in, in, uh, in family life in order to produce children. So all of these four bodily activities are regulated by the Shastras according to the ashram. But in the case of sleeping, then that Krishna mentions in the Bhagavad Gita, one should not eat too much or eat too little, sleep too much or sleep too little. One should balance that. And so what Prabhupada is saying is that if you sleep more than you need, that's the most dangerous thing because you waste time and time is short. And the other thing is that the senses become more strong for material satisfaction. But if you sleep more, you will eat more, you will eat more, your senses will get activated. I think it's one to one, it'll all clash. Yeah, it's connected. Huh. But if you regulate your eating, you won't all you won't also sleep more either. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mara. Thank you very much. Hare right. Krishna. Yeah, my my pronouns at your lotus feet. Please bless us with this. Damodar uh, Purushottam Mas, all of us want to go back home. If anyone says, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> Krishna, thank you, Sukhakar Krishna. Thank you so much. They were lovely. Now, Shiva Kumar Prabhuji, would you like to go ahead with your question? Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji. Dandavas Pranams Maharaj, please accept my, my humble voice and sensitive about his feet. Maharaj, from today's class, uh, very interesting point, Maharaj, that you shared. Um, and I have asked that question many times in the past in many classes as to the cultivation of the qualities. You mentioned the point that the cultivation happens within the situation, not away or outside of the situation. Uh, so uh, the question just came to my mind, Maharaj, and just pardon me if it's uh, very trivial. I'm still kind of thinking materially. If uh, taking tolerance as an example, Maharaj, if you have to practice tolerance, uh, say we read scriptures, we contemplate, and uh, we would like to kind of apply it to our life. Uh, but if we have to compare it to a material situation, Maharaj, if uh, say I want to become a weightlifter or a runner, I start the activity with a limit of my capacity, and then I slowly increase it by step by step. Whereas if I have to say, for example, uh, practicing tolerance, the situation in which I am put into, I don't have the control of situation, which may demand in a scale of say one to 10, it may demand, and just for picking up an example, in a scale of one to 10, the situation demands me to kind of tolerate at the rate of eight or nine, but my capacity is just one to start with. So uh, basically the situations in our life, they are not in our control to kind of apply these qualities uh, in, in a level that I can kind of practice step by step as yeah. against practicing. Material. You and you you have the control to respond according to the situation. You can you can't control the situation, but your response is is what's within your control. How you're going to respond to it. Mm. So some situations are more provocative than others, mm. and so how much you can deal with and what is the nature of that tolerance. 
sometimes tolerance is seen as uh, inactivity when there should be some kind of response to a situation. Now that you need to discriminate. Mm -hmm. Just like if someone is being someone is being offended in your presence and you simply tolerate it, then you also become somewhat implicated in that offense. You were meant to say something to respond to the to the person. Just like uh, you know, King Pariksha didn't tolerate uh, you know the bull and the cow being beaten by the uh, low class man. He came and he uh, immediately drew his sword to chastise the the, mid, the wrongdoer. So sometimes in the position, and just like uh, there was this one. Uh, particular incident where one famous uh, non-violent non proponent was declaring his uh, position of being non-violent in every circumstance. So one reporter approached him and said, my dear sir, yeah, you claim you're a non-violent and all, but what happens if someone comes along and violates your daughter? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna respond? And he said, well, he didn't answer directly. He said, in no circumstance, I will, I will act violently. And so the reporter pushed the point and then finally the reporter says, well, actually you are violent because you failed to protect those who require protection. Hmm. So that's another, that's the, the wrong kind of tolerance. That's not, so the situation has to be understood accordingly along with the persons involved and how you respond to it. Mm. But usually for ourselves, if we are attacked on, on a personal level, we can tolerate it and try to learn from it and take shelter of Krishna. Mm. But when it comes to other situations, we might have to somehow respond. Maybe not in a violent way, but in some way to ameliorate the situation or to block the wrongdoer from continuing. Mm -hmm. If that's the situation, so this is a it's a it's a situation a response and not a simply uh, complete uh, you know there's a definition that applies in all situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to see how to respond in a Vaishnav way mm -hmm. or not respond. <laughs> Shukumapu, you have to address Maharaj as respectful obeisances. To all Prabhu's humble obeisances, to all Maharaja's respectful obeisances. Just want to keep you informed. To all Prabhu, we say, please accept my humble obeisances. Mm. To all the sannyasis, respectful obeisances. Oh. Thank please. you. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> I don't agree. This is what uh, Jayapatak Maharaj taught us that all the sannyasis when they say that's the basis. Yeah, we have uh, humble obeisance to all Vaishnavas. And we can probably and you can respect even an ant because <laughs> his soul is there in, in that ant also. I think that was that was that was a time, place, and circumstance response. But in general, we can offer respectful obeisances to all living beings. Because we see the soul within it. But, but you are proper disciples, so we want to honor you as respectfully only, Maharaj. Because you are touched Prabhupada, you are being with Prabhupada. So we are seeing Prabhupada in you, Maharaj. Well, some people are not respectable, but still, because they are part and parcel of Krishna, we can offer respects. But we may not associate with that and become victimized by their wrong behavior, but still. There's, there's a type of respect that comes with with the, by offering all living entities. How we re, how we associate that one may be different. But for me, you are a pure devotee. I'm only respectful of it. Thank you, sorry, Maharaj. Well, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. No, no. It's not so cut and dry. <laughs> Hey Krishna Maharaj, I just have a question in regard to tolerance. 
what is it? Let me see how I want to say. I guess what is it about us that gives gives us a lack of tolerance? Basically, what is it that somebody somebody interferes with one of our material desire? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, and we are, and the false ego is the composite of all of our material desires, so they dent our false ego. I want to be respected. I'm not getting respect, so we're not tolerant. Mm -hmm. I want to be honored, and I'm not being honored, so I'm not, so I'm looking for honor. So because something we want is not being, is being challenged, uh, we, we, we become less tolerant. We can still become tolerant, but that's that's the reason why we don't become tolerant. We should become tolerant, but that's they're attacking something that is our character or our personality, which is the composite of our false ego. It's like you might belong to a particular culture and someone will criticize that. Just like <clears throat> Bhakti Tirta Swami said to Priyata Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, there, uh, there, are devo- there are devotees who are racist in our movement because he was black bodied. And Prabhupada said, yes, but if you're disturbed with that, that's your problem. So he made the point, yeah, what he was saying was true, but if you're disturbed by that, that's your problem. Let me see the point? Mm-hmm, I do, very much so. There will always be people who, you know, tread on some of our, our attachments or our, our identities. And if we're disturbed by that, that's our problem. <laughs> Exactly. We're not this body, that's why. <laughs> right. So to help ourselves with tolerance, we need to work on the false ego, letting go of false ego. Yeah. False Cultivating ego. it so that we understand the real ego. Well, the real ego is done and understood in two parts. One, I'm not this body, and two, I'm the eternal servant of the Lord. So the first one is to deny our false existence, and the the second part is to adopt our real existence. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for a beautiful answer. And very direct, I really appreciate that. Sri Devi Mataji, I saw you had your hand up. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I did actually want to ask, but I think Maharaj has already answered it just now with that racist uh, uh, comment about Bhakti Tita Maharaj. Okay. Mm-hmm. I saw another hand up too somewhere. That disappeared too. <laughs> Dear devotees, is there is there anyone else who has a question for Mar- Maharaj? We're so fortunate to have him with us today. So let's take advantage of his association. <laughs> Sri Devi, go ahead. I think I will ask this question anyway. Uh, dear Guru Maharaj, my humble obeisances, all glories to Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, I was uh, curious to know a little bit more about uh, Srila Prabhupada's reply to Bhakti Tita Swami, who said, you know, there is problems in the movement. So when we come across something similar in our institution of ISKCON, how should we respond to that particular uh, disturbance? Depends. Depends on the disturbance, depends on the person, but... It depends on the situation. There's no blanket answer for that. Respond or not respond depends on 
what is beneficial for for the for the situation what will ameliorate the situation what will will will, will, will bring forth krishna consciousness these are the these are the criteria by which you act so should we take some kind of action if we see that uh, a certain uh, department is not behaving correctly towards devotees or they have a track record of being very rude and uh, you know not very nice to devotees should we bring it to the attention of higher authorities or we are supposed to tolerate it that's up to you and if you do then you have to do it in the right way What would be the right way, Guru Maharaj, please? Yeah, you, you, the right way is to uh, alert the authorities, as you mentioned. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. My humble obeisance. Does anyone else have a question for Maharaj? Before we end, okay, dear devotees, let's all pay our humble and respectful obeisances to Maharaj for his time and association and enlightening us on such beautiful topics today. Vancha Kopa Tarubia Tarubia 